Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Got everybody's here today? It seems like everybody's kind of a little lethargic this morning. I see a lot of yawning, a lot of, uh, I'm just tired. Don't worry, spring will be here soon. Um, we are starting chapter two today. Um, I'm actually going to do like 16 verses. Try to cram it all in. Uh, these first 16 verses here. Um, you know, Paul was kind of switching his audience. He was talking, um, last week we talked about how, how God will get people over to their sins. And he was talking about the, the sins and, and uh, the Gentiles and the, and the Greeks and, and how if they want to live their, their life in a sinful rebellion against God, that God would give them over to their desires. You know, uh, that's he really talked about that um, sinfulness and humanity and stuff like that. And uh, and Paul's still talking about sin. Don't get me wrong, he's not going to change the subject, but he's kind of changing his audience a little bit. He's going from the from the people who are outside the church and don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, talking to the people in the church a little bit here. Um, I entitled this sermon "The Dangers of Judging Others." Um, like I said, it's in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Um, if you didn't bring your Bible, which, you know, I'm always going to encourage you to bring your Bible. It's on page 912 in the Pew Bible. If you, if you don't have, didn't bring your Bible, um, that's where we're going, to be, uh, we're going to be in. It's going to be in the first half of, of this chapter. So if you will, please stand as I read God's Word. It says, Therefore you have no excuse. Every one of you passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to, um, to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are the law to themselves, and that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts eternally accusing, or else defending them, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you um, for the ability to come in here and to, to worship you today, and God, um, being able to sing songs of praise and be able to come to you in prayer and, and doing all those things. But God, I pray as um, these words are spoken here today that, that it's going to be your words and not mine. That God, if you have put on my heart um, what, what you want to be said, and what I know it's only through your strength that I have the ability to do any of this. And I come, Lord, to the foot of the cross today wanting that strength because I know it's all about you. I want to thank you for what you do. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we can, as Christians, sometimes be quite clickish. You know, um, we have a tendency to build our own little holy huddle without special, with our special words and secret handshakes. And if somebody who shows up doesn't know these, these special words, uh, they can feel like a, maybe a fish out of water. I, I believe that there are a lot of unchurch people might be deeply attracted to Jesus Christ, but they're turned off by the Christian church, the mm -hmm. people in the church. I, I know as a youth, youth pastor, uh, there, there was times when um, people could be quite cliquish. Like they, especially 
especially in larger youth groups. You know, you, you get these people, and, I, and I've seen it at all levels. This, this group of people are over here, and they're friends, they've been friends for a long time, and they don't let people in their circle because they don't do that. You know, I, I've seen it both ways. You know, I've seen it all the way around, where, but it's just not in the youth group. I've seen it in adult churches where you have a certain group and you can't fit in that group. And when I talk to all my unchurched friends, I usually hear two complaints about the church. The first is the full hypocrites. I can see that. They even know they're not even more hypocritical than anybody in the world, but that they look at the church that way. And the second is that the church tends to be very judgmental. In fact, in the Bible verses I always hear is judge not lest you be judged. You know, I think that's one of the most common things you get, you know, say, well, the church is just so judgmental. Yeah, I believe that sometimes we, uh, we can be, and I think some people try to defend their judgmental attitudes. You, know, you point to biblical examples like Jeremiah and Isaiah, Elijah, Amos, all the Old Testament prophets who proclaim doom and gloom and, and judging Israel and Judah for all the things that they were doing wrong. We look in the New Testament and see people like John the Baptist who, who did the same thing. But we say things. Uh, but I, I believe that judgmental game is a dangerous game to play as a Christian. You know, last week we looked at the, the mess that the, that the entire human race is in. We, we saw that the root of this mess is a rebellion against God. It's our sinful nature. I mean, it's a universal human rebellion that's going to unleash God's judgment and God's wrath onto this world. And we, and we see that in, in everything because of that unnatural behavior. Talk about how bad human sin can be. I mean, Paul really, really talked about that. And he really had these, these large strokes, rust, uh, painted strokes of the fate of humankind against, apart from God. And how when we don't have God in our life, and when, when God is not, um, when we have not accepted Christ our Lord and Savior and, 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 and put God in that category, man, we can see how bad it's going to be. But Paul switches audience. And, and what he uses is called a diatribe here in this verse. A, a diatribe is something where the writer, writer verbally attacks and attends, attempts to destroy the ideals of the opposition. There's an anticipated question or objections of the opposition are expressed or noted and then answered and refuted. So Paul, Paul is writing these, this diatribe to not an individual but to a certain type of person. And, and, and what he's doing is he, he's, he's throwing this, this, this question out there, and then he's going to refute the question because he knows what's going on. You know, and, 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 and as Paul's writing this, I, I can see, like in the last part of that chapter, when it, that letter's being read to the Roman church, that there, there was a lot of probably head shaking in that, saying, hey, you're right, that, that we need to condemn, you know, idol worship and homosexual practices and, and violence and and those are good things. And you're right, Paul. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of head now. But when he turns the tables a little bit, I'm sure there was a little bit of a silence. Because what he's saying is that even though you know Christ, you have no excuse. You are just as bad. You, you sin just as bad as they do. And your punishment is just as bad as what theirs is coming to. If you don't have Christ. If you don't depend on God's grace. He's not discussing where some sins are worse than others, but that any sin should cause us to depend on Christ for salvation. And so today we're going to really look at, at why judging others is so dangerous spiritually. Why we cannot put ourselves in that place. So let's dig into the scripture. Let's talk about this a little bit. Verses 1 through 4 here in chapter 2 says, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things, and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing the kindness of God leads to repentance? So, you know, as Paul condemned the Greeks and Gentiles of their idolatry of worshiping 
idols and stuff like that. We see as he switches to this, it, it, it's a person cannot feel self-righteous because they're not guilty of the same sins as the Greek and the Gentiles. A person cannot feel like they're better than somebody else. It, 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 it's, that no one can be judged, that you cannot judge another. To judge another person is presume that you have nothing to be judged in yourself. And that attitude really reveals a sinful um, and hardened heart. You want to go to Luke chapter 18 and, and uh, verses 10 through 14. It is the story of the Pharisee and the public and of the tax collector. You know, we know that story very well. And that Pharisee stood up here and says, you know, I'm glad I'm not like these other people, these sinners like this guy over here. I give and I, and, and I, and I, and I, and I pray, and I keep the law, and I do all these great things. You know, and I'm glad I'm not like that person over there. And you know what the, the sinner, the, the tax collector, he's on his knees, he's beating his chest, and he says, Lord, forgive me. I'm such a sinner. I don't deserve anything. Jesus says that that tax collector went home justified, right? Because he didn't have that judgmental attitude as the Pharisee had. And, and I think uh, we, we cannot do it. I think Paul reminds us that, that we need to be self-aware of, of, of our sins. And we need to understand that human judgment is based on prejudice. It is based on, on partial perception. And, and that God's judgment is based on the truth. You know, he, he judges based on the facts of the things that we know. We, we judge on partial truths. We don't know everything that's going on. And so we cannot, we cannot put ourselves in that place of judgment. You know, it, Paul asked two rhetorical questions in verses 3 and 4. He says, don't you think for a minute that if you're passing judgment on somebody else that God's not going to judge you the same way you're judging somebody else? He says, don't you think for a minute? Man, he, he, he ridicules the idea that a person might escape God's judgment by correcting and analyzing the wrong in others. You know, how can... How can how can we expect to not face God's judgment if we are judging others, if we're having a, a contempt? Well, that's a theme in, in, in the book of Romans, isn't it? That you're going to sin, that we all have sinned, that every single person has sinned, and we all sin the same amount, is that nobody's going to sin any more than, than anybody else? And he follows that question up with, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Not knowing that the kindness of God leads to repentance. So do you really think light of, of God's kindness and repentance? That, 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 that he wants us really to understand that judging others shows contempt for God's kindness. It shows contempt for his tolerance and his patience. That God postpones his punishment in order that his kindness will lead some people to repentance. You know, 2 Peter 3.15 says, And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. It's easy to mistake God's patience for approval of wrong living. And I think we need to have, we need to have a little bit of self-evaluation. I think that's difficult sometimes. When we start getting a judgmental attitude, I think we need to kind of evaluate ourselves and where we stand before we start judging others. Uh, and I, I really believe we can't do that. I think we constantly need to be in prayer with God to show us our sins so He can remove them and we can repent of them. Verses 5 through 11. It says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render each person according to his deeds. To those by perseverance and doing good seek the glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. And to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of a man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. Man, it says a person who has a stubborn and unrepentant heart, those who sit in judgment of others are showing contempt for all that God has given. And he will pour out his wrath on those. You know that no one will ever escape God's judgment. Hebrews 9, 27, it says, Man is destined to die once, and apart from that, to face judgment. 
God's, God's judgment will be impartial. It will be based on what you have done. Verse 6 says it, it will be based on your deeds and what you have done. You know, that there is two judgments. There's going to be two judgments. The first one is when you stand in front of God, He's going to condemn you guilty for your sinfulness and the way you lived here on this earth. That's when Christ our advocate is going to step in and say, the Father, he's, he or she is mine. They made me Lord and Savior. They repented of their sins. That person is mine. And, and God will, will look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. But that's still not going to get you off of the hot seat when, when, when he will show you every deed and everything that's going on in your life. You know, Revelations 20, 12 tells us, and I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne, and the books were open, and, the, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from these things, which were written in the books according to their deeds. You know, John saw that in the vision, that, that we will be judged according to our deeds. I am not looking forward to that. I can tell you that right now. When he opens that book and he starts telling me the things that I did wrong, when he starts showing me these things, I will not have an excuse. I won't have a leg to stand on. I don't think either you all will either. But I know I won't. So we're going to be judged. I'm not telling you, you know, uh, for our deeds. And God's impartiality and our behavior is sure the final results. Man, for those who reject God, there will be suffering. There will be wrath. There will be hell. Because God's judgment is based on our, on truth and results. Not on who we are or where we came from. He will be impartial. He has to be impartial. He cannot look at one sin and say it's any greater than the other sin. He cannot look upon uh, things and he cannot be partial because of uh, somebody's father or grandfather was a minister or, or, or whatever. It doesn't matter about that. He's going to be impartial when it comes to our, our sinfulness. And only he can judge like that. I mean, for there is no partiality with God. You know, people's got this image that God is going to grade on some type of curve some type of moral standard, that there's something that 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 they're gonna be able to do good enough and that you know that that, that maybe you can do just enough to get over top of that curve, you know, to, to, to be okay. You know, and, and that's that's a misconception that they have about God. I mean they really just believe but we know that there is no passing line like that. Because because what really there there is is a chasm between us and God. And I don't care what you can do, you think you're good enough, you'll never be able to get over that chasm to God by yourself. You can't do it. Because God gives us only one way to get back to Him. That's through Jesus Christ. And He offers us something better than favoritism. He offers us grace. And I am grateful for that. Because I know I can't do it on my own. We get in verses... 12 through 16. Paul says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. And that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So we will be judged on the basis of the knowledge available to us. Uh, not because we don't know enough to conform to the code of the laws. You know, we think that there's a, this code and we don't understand that we need to do that. But we're going to be judged on the basis of what we do with what we know. You know, I, I, I look at that. Uh, we're not going to be condemned for what we know. We're going to be condemned for what we do. And there's faith. There's, 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 there's faith in that and, and obedience in that, that we're going to need faith and obedience, okay? Because we, there's a lot of people here about Jesus Christ, a lot of people who know the Bible.
God. But a lot of people who know about God, but they're not going to make that step of faith to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. You know, the, the, the knowledge is there, but they need to act upon that knowledge. They need to act and, 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 and make that step. Paul's point is that not one of us is capable of perfect goodness. Whether you know the law or don't know the law, whether you know everything or don't know everything, you need to make that step. Because at the human level, we all behave more or less in the line with the standards of our society. We do kind of fit in with the world a lot of times. But righteousness is not determined by what we do or what the most, what, what, what the most popular decision is. Righteousness is God's standard and God's character. And that's what we're aiming for. His judgment will be perfect based on his perfect knowledge of every action and every motive. But God will judge through his son, Jesus Christ. John 5, 27 says, And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. So Jesus Christ will execute that judgment. And the gospel that Paul preaches includes the wonderful message that through judgment is inevitable. Even though judgment is going to come, even though it will happen, it will be conducted through Christ. And those who have made him the Lord of their life, those who are trusted in him for their righteousness, God's judgment does not include fear or exposure for punishment. So I've really got three things I believe that judgment others do. In, in our life. I really got three things. I, 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 I think what it, it really can hurt our, 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 our spirituality. Our spiritual, spirituality. So the first thing is that judging others is dangerous because it gives us a false sense of security. A false sense of security. I think it's important that we and I look at the word judge and kind of define it. The word that Paul uses is the same exact word that Jesus has used in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, where he says, Judge not, lest you be judged. That word judge means to judge a person to be guilty and liable to punishment. And Paul uses this word here. He's talking about setting ourselves up as a judge over another person. <coughs> okay, he, he is talking about a judgmental, arrogant, and a hypocritical attitude that makes ourselves and puts ourselves above somebody else. That, that we look down on somebody and we pass judgment on them. Okay? Mm -hmm. He's not talking about moral judgment here. Here, okay? Let's say that that, that, that you hire a new babysitter to come and, 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 and watch your child while you and your husband go out on a date. And, and she shows up and, and, and like has tattoos over her whole body, ears, I mean, Lip pierced, no pierced, whatever. Has a cigarette hanging out of her mouth and a six-pack in her right hand. You're not judging her if you decide not to let her come in and watch your child. Okay? It's not some moral type thing. I mean, what parent would say, oh, well, come on in. You know, no, you, you're not going to let that. Or, or maybe you see a, a, somebody run a red light and hit, the, hit another car. You're not judging that person if you're telling the officer exactly what you saw. You know, it, it, it's not judgmental to say having an affair is morally wrong, morally wrong or, or stealing is immoral. Paul's talking about a judgmental, hypocritical attitude that puts ourselves as judges over other people. He says it, he says it lulls you into a false sense of security. You know, it, it, when, you, when you put yourself up over top of other people, You're thinking that your, your sins aren't as bad as those other people's sins when you're judging them like that. And we lull ourselves into a false sense of security. We fear those homosexuals have made God so mad that he doesn't know our gossip or our malice. Or maybe we, we, we figure God's attention is focused on some white supremacist maybe or, or so he doesn't notice our problem with pornography or slander or, or lying. We tend to split sins into two categories. My sins and their sins. And of course, their sins are always worse than my sins. You know, it's like having major and minor surgery, right? You know, Connie had her appendix, her, her gallbladder taken out. You know, I had 
cortisol shots put in my knee, and of course I said my cortisol shots were worse than her. God better be taking that because it was on me and not on her, you know. And I joked with her about that the whole time whenever she asked me to do something for her, you know. But I got up and I went and did it. I still thought mine was worse than hers. It's that way with our sins a lot of times. When we look at our sins in our in our life, and we think, well, I, my sins aren't that bad. But man, look at that person's. You know, I can't believe that they're doing that. They're doing those types of things. But my sins, nah. And I think we, we put ourselves in a false sense of security. Because God's not impressed by what we condemn. Okay? There's nothing wrong with calling a social problem sinful and wrong. There's nothing wrong with discerning between good and bad. But we must do that with humility and love. We get in trouble when we start thinking other people's sins are worse than ours. When we start looking down on people rather than looking at each other. Man, I, I really believe that, that when we do that, we put ourselves in and in, 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 we don't think we're going to be judged by God. We are. Bible teacher John Stott says, Paul uncovers in these verses a strangely human phobic. Namely, our tendency to be critical of everyone except ourselves. Mm -hmm. We often, we are often as harsh in judgment of others as we are lenient towards ourselves. Amen. This device enables us to simultaneously to retain our sins and our self-respect. So we need to be careful about judging others. Second thing I want us to see is that judging others is dangerous. Kind of goes in hand in hand with my last point because it blinds us to our own faults. It blinds us to our own faults. Now, how many times have we been in our car and get ready to switch lanes on the expressway and there's a car in our blind spot we start coming over? Or we've had a car come over on us. I don't think there's anybody who's ever driven who hasn't been over because they, they're right in our blind spots. You know? And, and I think a lot of times when we're, when we're condemning others or their sinfulness, uh, things in their life that we have a blind spot there. Okay? Amen. It, 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 we all have blind spots. We can change the way we talk about our faults. I think we have extreme uh, circumstances to justify our faults. We justify things. You know, when other people lose their temper, but we have a righteous anger. Or other people are jerks, but we're just having a bad day. Other people have a critical spirit, but we just simply tell it the way it is. Other people gossip, but we share prayer requests. Right. Other people are pushy, but we're go oriented. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 6, it says, Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say, your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. You know, Jesus says, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you think that your brother's got something wrong, you better take that plank out of your eye first. You make sure that your life is right before you start pointing out any sins in anybody else's life. You better hit your knees and repent. You better hit your knees and ask God to search your heart. You better hit your knees and, and make sure that you're right living with God before you even start looking at somebody else's. You know, there's a guy named Roger Williams who came to America in the 17th century. He became convinced that the Puritan church was too sinful and not pure enough. So he left Massachusetts and went to, 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 to Rhode Island and became, uh, and he founded Rhode Island. And there he became a Baptist and started the First Baptist Church of Providence, Rhode Island. But then, once he got there, he convinced that that church had too many sinners, that it wasn't pure enough. And so he pulled out and started another church, which was even smaller. And then, and then he realized that that church wasn't pure enough. And so he pulls out of that church. And it was just him, his wife, and his best friend. In the end, in the end, he was blinded to his own sins. And he became an unchurched Christian. Amen. The tendency towards blind spots in the church, I believe, is why so many unchurched people avoid 
Christian church at all costs. Because people come in, we forget about our blind spots. We need to be careful with that. I know I have to work on that myself. The last thing I want to see is that judging others is dangerous because it puts us in God's place. It puts us in God's place. You know, as we stand before God, we're going to give an account of how we live. None of us can stand based on our own works, our own morality, our own merits. Those who receive Christ's perfect life as a gift through faith will be able to stand before God. You know, in James chapter 4, verse 12, it says there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one is able to save and to destroy, stay, save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? James tells us that there's only one, one judge, one lawgiver, and that's God. You know, when we start trying to judge others, when we start thinking we're better than other people, when we start looking down upon them because of their sins, or whatever the case may be, what we're trying to do, we're saying that we're putting ourselves in God's spot. James said there's only one lawgiver. There's only one judge in the end. You know, like I said, there's nothing wrong with looking at something and saying that's morally wrong. But we can't judge that person. We need to allow God to judge that person. Because when we stand in judgment of other people, what we're saying is that we're putting ourselves in God's spot. We, when we play God, we're going to show favoritism. They don't act like us. They don't look like us. They don't talk like us. Okay? But somebody who, who looks and acts and talks like me, then I'm not going to judge them, but I'm going to judge this person over here who's not like me. We look on the outside. But we're putting ourselves in a spot where we don't need to be. Under moral cover, we're guilty of the most basic human sin there is. The sin of playing with God. That's a dangerous place to be no matter how moral, socially acceptable, or religious it is, or how we think about it. When we stand in judgment of others, we are putting ourselves in, in God's spot. And that's some place we don't need to be. We need to be humble. And we need to be below a God. And let Him judge. Let Him be the law. Because He's going to judge perfectly every single time. So to wrap up, we can see that judging others is extremely dangerous to our spiritual lives. I, I think it, it kills our spiritual lives when we stand in judgment of others. When we become judgmental, I, I think it really gives us a false sense of security. I, I think it, it blinds us to our own fault, and, and, it, and it puts us in God's role as a judge. And he should be there. The opposite of being judgmental is, is a tolerance of everything, though. I mean, tolerance says you must agree with everything that I do. You must allow me to do whatever I want. But the opposite of judgmental isn't preventing like everything's moral, pretending like everything's moral. But it's, we can't be always just saying that everything's okay. You know? We don't stand in judgment, but we, but we say, hey, that's wrong. How can we fix that? You know, it, it's just a, a, the way that we need to look at it. Before we judge, I believe that we must try to understand why that person's in that situation. We don't always know the situation why a, a person has gotten to where they've gotten to. We don't know the circumstances of why that person is there. And maybe if we had that understanding, instead of being judgmental, we're going to be more willing to help out. You know, so we cannot be judgmental. Judgmental. You know, it's no longer pretending like we have to, like we have our act together. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we have to admit that only we're only human, and the only reason why we are the way we are it is through God and His grace. You know what? When we see another per person stumble and fall, we need to admit that we're just like that person. You know, Paul says that we need to be careful when we judge and not have a critical heart. Question is, how is your heart today?